Hello and welcome once more to Conscious TV. I'm Ian McNay and my guest today is Dr. Amit Goswami. Hello, Amit. Hi. And um, Amit has written many books. Um, he is uh, a quantum physicist and he's basically done a lot of work in bringing science and consciousness together, which I've personally found very interesting and very important as well. And I've read four of his books, which I have here. He's written about eight or nine books altogether. There's God is Not Dead. There's How Quantum Activism Can Save Civilization. And we're going to feature this a bit at the end of the interview. The Quantum Doctor. The Visionary Window, A Quantum Physicist's Guide to Enlightenment. We'll also talk about this to an extent. And he also has a DVD out called The Quantum Activist. So, Amit, put these down. Just, just run through a little bit from your side of how you got from being a normal scientist to include the element of consciousness, which is still, unfortunately, quite rare in science. Yes, quite rare. Um, and I got into it completely by accident by, by fluke. I had no idea. Uh, all that happened was that my life was a mess. This I know. I was 37. Uh, you can call this uh, early midlife transition using Carl Jung's line. But whatever it was, I was unhappy, no question. I was at this conference and that conference brought forth kind of unhappiness that I have never experienced before like uh, intense jealousy, other people's success, lack of success on my part, nobody paying attention to me, moi, important contribution, I think. But I have doubts, obviously, about myself. So this goes on for the whole day. At the end of the day, at 1 a.m., I noticed that I have finished a whole packet of Tums that I always kept. This is for indigestion. It's indigestion. Yes. And I had it, so I always kept it in my pocket whole packet, so I was disgusted. Went outside the room that I was in at a party, went outside and it was on the ocean. So the ocean air hits me with cool air and the thought comes all of a sudden. Nothing ever expected like that. Why do I live this way? That's the thought. Why do I live this way? It was the first time you'd had a thought like that, was it? Right, first yeah. time, because yeah. I was quite content living, pa publishing papers, academic success. Not so much success in my personal life. In fact, personal life was a disaster. But academic life was going, supposed to be going okay. Yes. I didn't realize that there was so, un so much unhappiness. And after analysis, uh, it seemed intuited that uh, there must be a huge lack of congruence between my life and my livelihood. And the idea came to me that why do I live this way must mean that why do I live this unintegrated way, this incongruous way. I understand, yes. And so I was determined to find for myself happy physics, physics that will make me happy. I felt that what I was doing with structure of nuclei or what people generally do in physics, high energy physics and astrophysics and thinking of problems out there which has no bearing on our life, no bearing on our consciousness, no bearing on how to love your wife or love your children. Uh, this kind of physics is very much like in the medieval ages. You remember Christian monks used to wonder about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. So I realized that this is what I was doing. I was just escaping, and everybody is doing that, of course, but that doesn't justify me doing the same thing because it was making yes. me unhappy. If you be happy doing that, it's fine, but I was unhappy. I could not deny it. So that started a 12-year journey of the same unhappiness, but now with a direction. I have to find happy physics. 
Happy physics. I Happy physics. That, I haven't heard that term before. <laughs> it's a good term. Somehow, somehow, after about uh, five years, six years of searching, um, it led me to quantum measurement theory. So what kind of things did you try just briefly during those five or six oh, years? Oh, I tried. My childhood uh, brought me back to Indian spirituality a little, yoga. I started doing yoga. I think you said on the phone to me, your father was quite a spiritual man. My uh, father was quite a spiritual yes, man. Yes. Uh, I remember very distinctly how when I was, especially when I was upset as a child, how just his proximity would calm me down. It's, it's an amazing effect. Yeah. Only later on I met people, spiritual people. Uh, I would think that they are enlightened people, two of them, later on. I met with energies which are as profound as my father's. Mm. Very profound energy. This peace that you feel in the proximity of these people is one of the real verifications of what later on I identified as non-local consciousness. Yes. There is some sort of situation in these people. They are situated differently. Yes. We are situated and our thoughts go on, ego going there, going here, what shall I accomplish, what shall I wear, what shall I conquer today and what shall I do. These people's mind is not like that. Yes, so when you look back you saw that your father had something that you wanted in a way and you felt... It was, was very yes, intriguing, let's put yes, it that way. Yes. So when I, was, when I was having these uh, changes yes. coming to me, you know, I, was, uh, I started dreaming about my father mm. and one dream specially stood out. I am dreaming, my father appeared, he has a snake in his hand and he throws the snake at me and I catch it. So I went to a dream analyst. And um, the mentalist said, snake means transformation. So I thought, okay, so this confirms my situation. I need transformation. I need to change. Yes. So after that, I never dreamed again of my father. After I realized that I need to change, hmm. the dreams did not come back. And was he alive at this point? No, no, no he, he's he almost actually like he's passed away. Message quite, somehow, yes. Yeah. How interesting, yeah. And I think you tried meditation during this time. I was trying meditation. Yes. I was trying yoga. I was trying to get to all the spiritual people start that I could find around. I was meeting people such as Ramdas, people such as John Leary, who were quite famous at that time. And because I was a physicist, uh, gaining access to them was not very hard. So those are the avenues that I was moving. Yes. I was also talking to psychologists thinking that they would have something for me to do, physics of psychology or physics of consciousness. And quantum measurement theory, of course, has consciousness associated with it by that time. John von Neumann suggested consciousness collapses or changes quantum possibilities into actual events of experience. Yes. But that's dualism, so that was not very popular among physicists because everybody knows philosophy of dualism, how different non-material consciousness can interact with the material body is left um, dangling. And that problem is a severe problem for science because... Did, did, did you feel a little isolated? Absolutely. In your situation? Because, you, because it's very rare, especially at that stage, to do what you were doing. Yes. In, in trying to bring this conscious side to science. Yes, and, and, and people in my department were generally upset, no question. They were upset with you as well. Yeah, I had yes. conversations, several conversations with the department chairman. Yes. And some veiled threats. But I had tenure, I had gotten the promotion to full professorship, so I didn't worry about it. All yeah. they could do is to stop my salary increases, and I didn't care. So you came to this realization Everything, I'm, I'm reading that from notes from one of your books, everything starts with consciousness. Consciousness is the ground of all being. Yes. You must have been quite excited when you realized that. Well, this was probably the most exalted experience in thought that I ever had. I had equally comparable experiences, but without thought. Any experience that could be called a creative insight 
this probably is the greatest creative insight that ever came to me. Mm. Uh, realizing that consciousness is the ground of being is an adequate foundation for doing science. How, how did this come? Did it come when you were intensely thinking or did it just come as a realization? No, nothing like that. I was talking to a mystic friend yes. named Joel Morrit. He was quite a man himself um, and um, a little bit younger than me. But I, uh, and he used to argue a lot. So this was one of the evenings. I was in Ventura, California. I heard Krishnamurti that day. That was something that must have softened oh, me up. You see Jay Krishnamurti? Jay Krishnamurti. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And so that must have softened me up or something. Mm, because he and I had argued many times about this kind of thing. And I usually would be a little high-handed. He was only a filmmaker. And I'm the physicist. So, you know, physicists have practically monopoly over the world or how to analyze the world, right, in this culture. So I was high-handed with him and I was lamenting that, look, this quantum measurement problem, how quantum possibilities become actual events of conscious experience, we just are not able to solve it. Mm. How can consciousness be a brain phenomenon and still transform possibilities into actuality because brain itself should be a possibility according to quantum physics. So you, you had this realization that consciousness is the ground of being and then you realized after that that there was science, conventional science was upward causation and your realization meant there was downward causation. Right. Just briefly explain what that is to the viewers, upward causation and downward causation. Yes, this is basic, because if you include consciousness without causal power, you really have not done anything, and scientists could say that consciousness is just a So what is causal power? This is causal power. So downward causation is the causal power of consciousness. That, of course, has always been postulated by religion, so that is nothing new. But religions, the reason that they fall short, A, is dualism. How does a non-material body interact with the material body? And the second is, they never spell it out. What does it mean? How does God work? Does he just wave a wand and then things happen, like a soul goes to hell or heaven, depending on good deeds or bad deeds that he or she has done? <laughs> so that kind of thing, uh, of course, is very repugnant to modern people. So Correct. Let's, let's start with the ground of consciousness, which I'm putting up there rather than down there. No, that's fine, that's fine. About. So, and then what are the various levels or layers underneath that? So you start with consciousness. And, and then, then, then it gets a little subtle. Quantum physics says that objects are possibilities. This is the key. So everything, whether it's your DVD or a glass or your hat, or my hand, they're all possibilities. They're all possibilities, and that's the yes. key. Because you see, the, always the puzzle that people have felt, how could consciousness, which is something conceptual, something nebulous, something woolly, contain matter which is solid, which is rigid, which is hard? How can that be? How can something woolly, something nebulous, contain solid stuff? So saying that Kingdom of God is earth. Kingdom of God is everywhere on earth doesn't help because people cannot comprehend how can that be because uh, everything is nebulous up there and here I think everything is concrete. So quantum physics says, quantum physics resolves this dilemma first of all by saying that no, everything is really all woolly stuff, all nebulous stuff, possibilities. Okay, so how do we then get from a possibility to something that's tangible that we in our dualism can see. So that for that tangibility, we go back a little and explain what upward causation is. Okay. So upward causation means elementary particles are the base level of yes. all matter. Elementary particles make more and more complex objects, atoms first, molecules. Molecules make the cells living cells so we start and with other bulk something matter. that's tiny, tiny, tiny. Tiny, tiny, tiny. Something a little bit bigger. A little bit bigger, a little bit bigger. bigger than molecules and then the right. cells. And by the time they make cells, we almost begin to see them. Yes. And then, then cells, neurons, make the brain. 
and then the conventional wisdom of conventional sciences that brain makes consciousness, mind, all this stuff that we experience inside of us. Yes. Thoughts, feelings, all that stuff. So, um, of course, in that case, question arises, if consciousness has to change, because this was already suggested, mind you, von Neumann, the great mathematician suggested that, look, uh, he proved a theorem. The theorem says no material interactions, upward causation, in other words, these interactions of the elementary particles that rises upward and forms conglomerates like atoms, molecules, cells, brain, that kind of upward interaction, material interaction, just cannot convert possibility into actuality. It just cannot do it. According to the mathematics of quantum yes. physics, it just cannot do it. Yes, so you start with something new, which is a downward causation. Which is downward causation, which von Neumann already suggested, but that doesn't work, because how does consciousness exert downward causation on matter? Yes. Of course, the idea is to choose among the possibility. That part makes sense. But how? Because any interaction, according to scientists at that time, requires a signal to go from consciousness to the brain, but no signal ever goes outside of the material world. The material world, energy, is always a constant. So this was the problem with dualism. And how do you avoid dualism? So that night when I realized consciousness is the ground of being, I also realized that if that is so, then of course material possibilities, these quantum possibilities, are all within consciousness. They are part of consciousness. Yes. So when consciousness chooses, consciousness chooses from itself. If you choose from yourself, you don't need a signal. If you choose from yourself, you can choose without any interaction. But what is choosing from consciousness? Or how is consciousness choosing? Or why is consciousness choosing? Or why can be answered. How, of course, is irrelevant. It's choosing without using signals. That much is yes, what matters. No, I, I realize that. And, 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 and so why does consciousness choose? That will take a while for us to get into. Okay. The why is the purpose of manifestation? That yes. much can be said even now. What's the purpose of manifestation? What's the purpose of choosing? We'll come to that. that has, evolution has something to do with it. But the, at that moment, for solving the quantum measurement problem, this is the crucial concept, that consciousness chooses without any signals, without interaction that consists of exchange of signals. So the question is, is there, is there such communication without signals in reality, in the world of manifestation? And this is where this idea, signalless communication, quantum non-locality, this idea becomes the supreme idea that I was putting forward, that consciousness must be non-local. Consciousness is capable of non-local communication, communication without exchanging signal. And that's how it communicates with the material waves of possibility. So that's non, how non it chooses. Is means it's not anywhere as such. It's, it's not, not anywhere as such. It's, uh, it's, if you it's want everywhere. To think, if nowhere. you want to think of a picture, it's everywhere and nowhere. You, yes. have, to, you have to do it paradoxical. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, paradoxical language is the only way you can express it properly. Or we loosely call it outside of space and time. Loosely, very loosely. But it's everywhere and nowhere. So it, it, it's complex because the effect of this whatever that is outside of space and time, where signalless communication can take place, that is, is, is something that you really cannot express in its fullness without including paradoxical language. Yes. The crucial point is that no signal is involved. Yes. So the crucial experimental question was that are there signalless communication between brains? And that experimental question, thanks to Hakobo Greenberg, who was a Mexican neurophysiologist, was answered within a few years. In 1993-94, he found that, yes, human brains can indeed communicate non-locally. Right. Amazing experiment. Yes. So, uh, but that came later. I already had published my paper on quantum we measurement theory. We also had uh, Rupert Sheldrake on Conscious TV, and he very much talked about that as well that kind of communication. Yes. Yeah.
Very much. I mean, this is the basis of all paranormal phenomena. This is the basis of um, quantum consciousness in non-locality, in, in healing. We have now distant healing experiments. This, this is the basis of that. It explains many things, doesn't it? Explain a, a whole bunch of things. Yes. It, it, the the non-local consciousness is an idea whose time has come. It not only solves the quantum measurement problem, not only allows us to develop a new paradigm of science, but it really solves the fundamental problem that scientific materialism has created, which is that it's, an ex, it, it's, a, it's a science of only objects. It's a science of insentient matter. It's a science of non-living matter. But it does not have anything to say about the living experience. It does not have anything to say about conscious experience. It, says, it cannot say anything about where is the experiencer, who is the one that experiences. There's nothing to say. These science that we have developed, that we worship even today by at least 50% of the people, this science has nothing to say about who you are, who am I, who the self is, how consciousness is represented in the brain. So how did that affect you? Because you were looking for happy physics. So how did it affect you in your personal life when you discovered that? Did it bring you anything in terms... It brought you understanding, I realised that. Did it bring you more happiness? Well, yes and no. The... I expected, I expected uh, much more glamorous results from this exper experience of realization because this is what many people say as the realization through what in Indian tradition is called jnana yoga, yoga wisdom. What I had done was discovered the through the wisdom tradition, to studying and creative understanding, I have resolved the paradox in my mind that how could non-local consciousness, or God, if you will, if you use religious language, exist. So that should have been a very transformative experience. But you know what my surprise was? I was not ready for this one. I thought naively, because that is what my readings told me, that if you had such an experience, you're instantly transformed. Nothing like that. Right. I found that, yes, there is great amount of capacity that was certainly released immediately. I certainly saw myself as much more creative in my thinking. And indeed, I could write better. I could express myself better. All that is true. But you know, to my great dismay, I found that I still had the same difficulty about loving my wife, loving my children, loving people around me. I was still uh, quite competitive. Little less, agreed. Realizing that consciousness is the ground of being, consciousness is non-local, ultimately you and I are when starting to speak about that to people, softened me down a lot. Yes, it was like you had the realization, but my guess is it had to be integrated. It has to be lived. That yeah. is what I was missing. Yes. Fortunately, I came across the idea of creativity, and, and I got into developing a theory of creativity. Creativity researchers have already shown that creativity consists of four stages. Preparation, which I did. Incubation, it happened automatically. I didn't know that sitting and being both are important as well as doing. I didn't know, but I sat and be a lot of my time because when I was not doing regular physics anymore, I had huge amounts of time left to me because I was not in the humdrum of publishing and perishing that kind of world anymore. So I had all the time to write maybe one paper a year. And so that gave me whole afternoons, I remember, sitting with a tall glass of Diet Pepsi in the student <laughs> union cafeteria. So I had a lot of just sitting, doing nothing. So I was doing this, what I now call a dooby dooby do practice, alternate doing and being. Very alternate intense. Alternate doing and being. Do, doing and being. So just very briefly distinguish between them, doing and being. So doing is the intensity that I felt whilst studying the question, questions mm. of consciousness. Right, so you are active. I'm such. active. I'm stroking yes. the unconscious, okay. so to speak. Yeah. 
being is unconscious processing, the processing that is most important for creativity. It happens in the unconscious, not in the conscious. Right. That's so where possibilities are generated for consciousness to choose from. Because okay. remember, it has to be a new idea. So new possibilities have to come. You are never going to get new possibilities to yes. conscious searching. Yes. I understand. So you're doing doing and being. Doing and being. And, and, and then uh, the quantum leap, insight. But then creativity researchers found, okay, insight, of course, that quantum leap is what is most aggrandized. That's what is called enlightenment, to whatever name you give. But name doesn't matter. The point is enlightenment is not it. It's very important, of course. Insight is very important. It's a stage, isn't but, it? But then the insight has to be lived. And that fourth yeah. stage of creativity is called manifestation. Okay. And wow, is manifestation hard for when you are trying to embody consciousness? <laughs> I still haven't finished the journey. <laughs> it's still going on. Yes. And I don't know if in this life I will ever be manifested being like but I think. Uh, do, you see that, do you see what is still going on? Do you see that? as also an element of doing on your, in, in your part in, in, in being aware of, of your reaction to situations and your programming, or do you see it as a process that happens on its own? Or a bit I, of both, I think, maybe? I think, I think I have resolved that uh, to some extent by realizing that uh, there will be a time when I'll know. Right now, I'm very much into what I call accomplishment. I want to accomplish, I want to change the world, I want to change myself, I want to love my wife even better than I do today without even less reaction that I have today. I want to have that same relationship with everyone in the world, um, even with my antagonists. Jesus did say, love thy yeah, enemy. Yeah. I take it very seriously. Yes. If I can learn how to love my enemy, that day I might say that, okay, Amit Goswami, you have crossed another hurdle about manifesting love in your life. Okay, at this point, I want to I want to very much connect that with something else that I thought was very interesting, which is what you, how you see free will. Because pretty much with upward causation, I understand free will doesn't really exist. Right. But with downward causation, there is an element of free will. So you can have the intent to love your wife or be more creative or whatever because that is contained in the downward causation. That, that could be contained in the downward causation. Could but be. by okay. intention from the ego level, we just put out the word, we just put out the idea. And then it's a question of will the idea resonate with non-local consciousness? Because ultimately the ch quantum chooser is at that non-local level of consciousness. So we put the, uh, from our self, individual self, we put the idea out, and it's almost where the decision gets made in an, an area which is not separate, but it's part of the non-local, as you call it, consciousness, which is part of the oneness, as I would call it. Right. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. And we can be a little more specific. So any conscious idea that we generate, that idea, if it is sufficiently stoked, will get into the unconscious because a memory will be made and whenever we are not collapsing thoughts, that memory will play in the unconscious. Possibilities will be generated from that memory. This is what we're looking for. So the possibility of transformation, this unhappiness that I don't know how to love, this helplessness that what makes me so irritable, what makes me so defensive in my reactions when a love object comes into the vicinity. What is it? We can't handle our irritability or defensiveness with an intimate person. If it's not intimate, we do fine, oftentimes. But with intimate people, we always get into this defensiveness, irritability, negative reaction. Why is that? Because we have these memories and they're continuously giving possibilities into our unconscious. So by stoking love, stoking the intention, we create additional possibilities in the unconscious. And these other possibilities and these existing possibilities, they interact. They have interaction, this conflict. Will you go on the same old, same old way? 
or can you change? You see, you also talk about in one of your books about how the feeling that we are separate or the belief that we're separate is causing a lot of our pain. Yes, belief that we are separate actually does produce a separateness of mind from the physical, vital from the physical. Our feelings become separate from thinking. And, and this is uh, pain. It's, uh, you know, the, I have felt pain several times in my life, especially when I have become single in between my marriages. Those times of intense loneliness, you feel separate from the whole. Why do you feel separate? You feel completely unloved. You feel, you feel that um, nobody cares for you. In those moments, if you knew that there is a quantum self, a representation mm -hmm. of God in our selves, and there is this self to comfort us. Many people call this self as God, the comforting God, the God that comes to your aid, who, who, to whom you call out when you are in danger, when you are lonely, when you are feeling separate. But I didn't even know, in my, after my first marriage broke up, I didn't mm -hmm. even know that this happens. The second time my um, marriage broke up, I did know. And this was much, much less the loneliness. I did feel a little, but I did not feel anything with the intensity that I felt first time. So indeed, uh, this kind of realization helps us to deal with separateness. And if you are not separate anymore, that's uh, already a very good sign. But coming back to what, what signals the end of the search, so long as I have accomplishment orientation, I want to accomplish. So long as that happens, we accomplish. And that accomplishment may involve outer stuff. I write books. Accomplishment also involve inner stuff. I learn to love. And uh, this goes on. I learn to more, be more just. I learn to appreciate beauty a little more. I learn to appreciate truth a lot more, and so forth. Both goes on. But these are all accomplishments. A time comes that when you just are bored about accomplishments. You don't care anymore. This is the crucial thing. When that comes, then you are ready to do your final accomplishment. And this is the search for self-realization. Then you want to realize how God is represented in this what is called the quantum self that I mentioned a little early on. Then you want to know this quantum self directly. This is not a Jnana experience like I had before. This is not an ordinary Samadhi experience which I also had. This self-realization experience is beyond all experiences. This is the highest experience that a human being can go. Then you know the nature of the self. When that creative idea comes, what is the self? By direct realization. Even then, though, you have to do the final step of that creative process, which is to manifest, shift your identity from the ego to the quantum self. Manifest God in your life. In a way, that's a dilemma, because the one that often wants to shift have the shift is the ego itself. because it That's it's right. Going to be happier. So that is why spiritual traditions always say surrender the ego. That's the last step. And you know how ordinary people interpret what spiritual traditions say and what gurus tell you? It's horrible because everybody interprets they have to give up the ego to gain access to spirituality. No, spirituality contains in the vast part of the spiritual journey Spirituality has to involve the ego, because without the ego, there is no creativity. Yes, well, I, I was just looking at my notes, because you, you talk about this, that we need the ego. Ego loves the old. It's, it's conditioned, as you said, but it also gives us a reference point, too. Which is Absolutely. It gives us stability. Who would we be? Uh, in, in a human interaction. Yeah. yeah. So, so long as who would I be is important to me. So long as that importance remains, you know? How can I give up the ego? Now, how many people do you see around, including the gurus around us, including those people who are, you know, great thinkers and we respect them, supposed to be enlightened and all this? How many people do you know whom you can go and take your shoe off and give a throw out on the head? How many people do you know that don't feel insulted and would start shouting at you? 
<laughs> so when you are in that state, yeah. where nothing is an insult anymore because you are nobody. Richard Alpert was a, you know, he later confessed to me that he was a pretender, but he went through that. He went through that phase where he used to pretend. Um, he would, used to start his talks as, I'm nobody special, talking about nothing special. But he knew, he, he told me himself, that I knew that, of course, I'm faking, because this is what I'm supposed to say. So when that happens, then we come back and realize that you have a lot of work to do, that that stage has not come yet. When that stage comes, when I'm ready, then I won't be interested in myself anymore. I'm ready to let it go. At that point, we can start the final journey. Before that, if you start it, it's fruitless because you will have the experience of self-realization. But you will still want to be somebody with that realization. Well, I think the two run for a time, don't they, for many people that are searching and open to looking, the two, the both are running. There's, there's still the, the wanting to be, to a degree, successful on the outside, still yeah. looking, and yet the understanding that the fundamental work is on the inside. <laughs> yeah. And I suspect that's been the same for you the many, yeah. for many years. The fundamental work is to giving up that search, giving up the idea of being somebody, being the teacher, being the guru, being, being the world teacher, being the world-renowned great, great person who everybody listens to. All that just drops away. Then you just sit. If people come to you, fine. Let them be happy. That's fine. It doesn't matter, but, but you are always situated in that peace. This is what brings that extra capacity of non-local consciousness in the proximity of great, great people. And that's what we're all looking for, really, is peace, isn't it? Yes. Ultimately, we are looking for a complete, peaceful mind. Yes. <laughs> it's a tremendous journey. Yes. And I'm so grateful that quantum physics allows me to understand most of this journey, although I have not achieved some of these later stages. But quantum physics allows me to analyze even the highest stage of realization, I think, I hope. Right. I'd like to, to go back a bit in something we didn't, we didn't cover in... in any kind of detail which I think would be helpful for people and for me too, would be this point at which the, we need the observer for the ground of being to become something tangible. And I know you talk about a quantum collapse, which is not easy to grasp. Can you just take us through that, how that fits together? Uh, well, uh, this is the most complex question of the theory that had to be built. The, uh, this question, how consciousness actually embodies itself in the brain, amounts to the brain having a very special situation in its body. It has to have a very special situation with which consciousness can get trapped, consciousness can identify. Because that's what must be happening. Look, the observer himself or herself is also a quantum possibility. So the possibility is looking at possibility, cannot be denied. You, possibility, looking at this flower possibility. I hope the flower is coming on the television picture. It is, I can see it on the monitor, it's there. <laughs> so, possibility looking at possibility. How does collapse happens and then this possibility becomes actualized, but where went the brain? Where did the brain go? If you were outside of both brain and the flower... Yeah, I think you must describe, first of all, explain what is collapse. What do you mean by collapse? Co collapse is just another word. I have a habit of, te te technical habit of a physicist. Physicists call from the beginning this idea of wave becoming particle as wave collapsing into a particle. Okay. So in a way, you see it the other way around. If something collapses, it disintegrates. But here you're saying... The collapse is nothing becoming something, in one way. In a way, yes. Nothing becoming something. Manifestation. That's the collapse. It's the collapse of the wave. The wave is becoming right. a possibility. Yeah, possibility yeah. becoming But you actuality. need the observer effect for that you to You need happen. the observer effect. So, but observer is also possibility. So what has happened is that consciousness, why don't we see the brain in the process? Because both collapsed. Flower there, brain there. But you are not seeing the brain. You are seeing only the flower. In the process, consciousness is identified with your brain. And the brain is saying, 
I see the flower. So what is in the brain that allows consciousness to identify with the brain? This is the key question. And the answer actually was given by a fellow without knowing it named Doug Hofstetter, brilliant physicist. I knew him actually, who was a student at the University of Oregon where I taught. He wrote a book called Godel Escher Buck, beautiful book. In that he suggested that if you have a tangled hierarchical system, a system in which you cannot trace the hierarchy from the beginning to the end. In between there is a singularity, a, a discontinuity, so that it, it's impossible to construct these tangled hierarchical systems from scratch. Does the, mem does the brain have that? Yes, the brain does have it. If you think about it, brain at the surface state, at the macroscopic state, allows ourselves to perceive, and then it makes memory. That if you look at these two concepts, perception and memory, perception, of course, is required for memory. But funny thing is that memory is also required for perception. There are many, many stories that if you have no memory of an object, you cannot see it. Well, that's right. I've, I've read that many times. Uh -huh. In fact, Deepak Chopra, you yes. talked about earlier, he, he, he was, I remember reading once that he was talking about certain tribes in the Amazon. They can see, they're like when we see a plane and, and we see the, 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 the exhaust behind the plane, they can see a similar, something similar behind birds when they fly. Yeah. And they can see that, but we can't see we that can't because see. we're not trained to see it. Uh -huh. It's not our reality, is it? Our consensus reality. So that's a tangled hierarchy. When two things require each other, that's a tangled hierarchy. So brain has a tangled hierarchy. If there is a tangled hierarchy, then we identify with it. To see the identity, examine the sentence, I am a liar. If I'm a liar, then I'm telling the truth. If I'm telling the truth, then I'm lying. If I'm a liar, then I'm telling the truth. If I'm telling the truth, I'm lying. If you go on in, ad infinitum, notice that you cannot really come out without consciously realizing, what am I doing? This is silly. I won't play this game and you jump out. But you tend to identify. For a while, it will be quite tempting to go on. Oh, this is mm. fun. Children, in fact, sometimes start crying because they would say, I cannot just go on like this, but how do I get out? <laughs> so that's a tangled hierarchy, this infinite oscillation okay. between two extremes. But where did the initial observer come from to create the manifestation so now, now of examine the universe? It. So now examine it going back, and what do you see? If, if I am identified, if I am trapped in this circularity, right? then I'm identified with the sentence. So similarly, if I'm trapped in the circularity of the brain, perception requires memory, memory requires perception, then I'm identified with the brain. So what we call the observer arises after the event of collapse, after the change of possibility into actuality. In the process, both subject, the identification of consciousness with the tangled hierarchical brain and the change of the object, collapse of the object, both have taken place in the same process of choice. Consciousness chooses, out of the choice is born the observer, okay. as well as the, what the observer okay. is observing. Mm. So this is why Krishnamurti, and there, was, there was a very beautiful word that Krishnamurti used. For the brain, observer is the observed. I have read that sentence many times before. So say that again. For the brain, the For the brain, observer is the observed. The observer is the how observed. Do you, how okay. do you think of the brain processing a picture of, picture of you that I am processing right now? You are an image on my retina. This much everybody understands. And then that retina image is uh, processed by electrical system of the brain. Everybody understands. But then you get an electrical image. Is that electrical image, somebody, a little me, watching in the back of the brain? There is a television screen and a little me, a homunculus, is watching that. That kind of funny picture, that's what people have, unfortunately. So by recognizing that, no, the observer and the observed, the, the homunculus and the picture on the screen, they are the same.
there is no difference, there is no mm -hmm. distinction. The observer arises because consciousness is identified with this whole thing, memory and perception, the whole apparatus that we call the brain. Mm -hmm. That's the mystery of how consciousness becomes embodied. And this mystery cannot be solved within scientific materialism. There is just no way. Scientific materialism says we have a science of objects. Objects only gives you object. You can never get a subject separate from the object by starting with objects. You've got to start with consciousness. <laughs> okay. So does the universe have a purpose? Yes. The universe has a purpose, and that purpose is to manifest the highest ideals, which Plato called archetypes. Aurobindo had a, even a more beautiful name, supramental, the supramental values. But how do you know this? How do I know this? By, by studying the theory of evolution from a consciousness point of view. Okay. Theory of evolution is conventionally seen as Darwinian. In fact, media treats Darwinism as evolutionism, basically. It is not right. This is just so very wrong. Because in normal circumstances, if physicists, biologists, chemists did not have such a feud with religions, under normal circumstances, all scientists, in fact, physicists and chemists do recognize this, it's the biologists who are very stubborn, would recognize that Darwin's theory just does not hold water. It is a good theory. It has served well the purpose of developing biology as a science because there was nothing before Darwin, nothing much. So Darwin made biology respectable. All that is true, that's, but that's only historical gratitude. Like physics is very grateful to Newton for what he did. But to say that physics is Newton today would be a complete mistake. Newton has been suppressed by Einstein, by quantum physics, and many, many developments have occurred in physics that Newton could not even dream of. So biologists should be able to do the same thing, except that they cannot because of this feud with religion. Christians, even to this day, creationists hold a completely different picture that defies evolution because they are so sure that everything in the Bible must be literally true. Just similarly, the biologists have accepted the dogma that Darwinism must be absolute. If you give up Darwinism, it's very easy to see that um, there are gaps. There are gaps in the fossil records, and these gaps have to come from somewhere because they suggest that consciousness must have two tempos, one very fast and one slow, like Darwin says. So Darwinism describes a slow evolution. This first evolution, how does that come? If you are looking from consciousness point of view, remember the process of creativity, quantum leap, yes. the discontinuous yes. change, that is the key. So the first aspects of evolution, if you explain that as quantum leap of consciousness, you include consciousness. So why is consciousness creatively unfolding the world, manifesting the world in progressive steps of creativity? Why is it doing that? you find immediately, you find one astounding thing. The amoeba and humans both have some commonality. Amoeba can reproduce, so can the human. But look at the biological process of reproduction. Amoeba reproduces by cell division. That's it. They don't even have differences of male and female. No sexuality there. Male, female develops a little later on in evolution. One progress already, but still sex is being used for just reproduction. And then later on brain develops, we have circuits of pleasure, then sex is used for pleasure. Second stage of sex. But for human beings, especially in the 21st century, people are already moving on to another, even higher exploration of sexuality and reproduction. And this is the use of sex to make love. Make love. Nothing less than love. They are investigating, can I love my sexual partner unconditionally? Many people are searching like this. I teach people to do that because in my own life, that is a major practice. This kind of evolution of something that starts at a rudimentary level, but then ends up becoming better and better representation. This is the objective of evolution. Initially, we cannot fathom love. So we don't have it. It's just self-dividing. And then we have 
okay, there is the possibility of loving the other, but it's remote. It's just sexual reproduction. And then it gets a little bit better. Now there is pleasure in, in, in sexuality. So the uh, other is welcome now, not just mere reproduction. Other is good. It will give me pleasure. And then stage comes where the other is necessary for the exploration of a value, love. And then maybe there are even higher stage, which we so, don't know so, about. So how do you put this together with, because you have this book, Quantum Activism Can Save Civilization. This how is, does this come together on a practical basis? This is, of course, I feel the most important thing today for all thinking people, all feeling people, all people who want to integrate their lives like I did, have to face up with what these ideas that we spoke of as scientific materialism, consciousness doesn't exist except as brain phenomenon, matter is everything, what these ideas have done is literally undermine those values which is the purpose of evolution, which is what makes living worthwhile. Consciousness gives us values. If you denigrate consciousness, values would automatically be denigrated. Does the brain as a conglomerate of elementary particle have values? Material scientists try to bring values back in through evolution, but they cannot do it because matter cannot even process meaning, let alone values. These things are subjects of scientific proof today. We should give up on scientific materialism if we want to save civilization. Unfortunately, scientific materialism is also very entrenched today. You have to realize that, and then you have to recognize the power of activism. But, but you see, when I switch on my TV, which I do sometimes, and I watch the news, it doesn't matter which new channel you watch, it's not usually very encouraging. <laughs> so I'm just wondering how, obviously, quantum activism in itself is, is what you see as a way forward and yet it would seem, from our media anyway, that the way forward is a long way away, if there is one. I just wonder how you see it, no, well, practically for the average person, what yes, quantum activism uh, yes, means. Yes, this is, the, this, is the, this is what the average person needs to know. It's, it's, it does seem very remote today. But you know, it, uh, two answers. First of all, it seemed remote when a few scientists, Descartes, Francis Bacon, a few scientists were struggling against the power of the church. It seemed very remote then, didn't it? So uh, it means nothing that it seems very remote. Several decades ago, it seemed remote that communism can ever break down in Russia. So how movement of consciousness work is actually by jolts, by surprises. This is what the nature of creativity is. So that's one answer. So that's the quantum side, is the surprise side. In surprise a way, side of it. It, it would be creative, it would be a revolution. It would be some kind of, not, like not social the, revolution, I don't mean that. was a big change, we weren't yeah, really But big changes that. come abruptly, suddenly, yes, even yes. social changes. The other aspect is, which is very, very hopeful for everyone, I hope, which is that it does not take very many people to do it. Rupert Sheldrake first had this intuition. He published a book, uh, or several books in the 80s, where he put forth this idea that only a few people, because changes that we make in our brain involves what Schilder called morphogenetic field. Yes. These fields that are responsible in some way, that I call blueprints of biological form. So when we change the brain, make a uh, positive emotional brain circuit of love, let's say, the morphogenetic fields associated with love, which is the blueprint of that brain, that becomes associated with love, and therefore it will become a loving morphogenetic field. It's a changed morphogenetic field. That change, I was able to show, Mark Mitchell and I, that that change in the morphogenetic field is stored not in the brain, but is stored non-locally. Quantum memory is non-local memory, yeah. outside of space and time, everywhere and nowhere. And then what happens? If it's non-local memory, anyone on Earth, irrespective has, of has time access. and space, yeah. can access it, right? Yeah. right. So in the future, or this is the vision, vision is that if enough of us, if enough of us 
become conscious that we need to change and we are capable of we are capable of the creative experience we are capable of turning our creativity inward create brain circuits of love and we do it in communities we do it in groups we do it such in such a way that non locality will be facilitated facilitated what happens so these non local memories are available in the future and they are used automatically without effort but you see, but you see, I mean, and I think you talk about this in one of the books. It's, it's people in a way struggle for values. They're very caught in the whole consumerism, the whole materialistic aspect of society, and and, and people are very many people are very lost in terms of where to start. Yeah. So, so the, that's the other part of quantum activism. So we develop these people who will develop brain circuits, which will then propagate in the future through non-local means. That's one idea, and the other idea that is very important to recognize is that we can change the marketplace. Right now the marketplace only sells material goods and it's sort of almost hypnotic. We go on believing that a, a more capable cell phone is going to give a more satisfactory life. Of course it doesn't. So unhappiness actually goes on increasing in this consumer society. But suppose we start to consume the stuff that we value. Suppose you started consume meaning, values, and especially, I'll tell you the real key of this is, suppose you started making vital energy, vitality, as a commodity in the marketplace. Can we buy vitality? Yes, it turns out that yes, people are already thinking of producing vitalized water. I am working with a Brazilian company to produce vitalized cosmetics. What does that mean? <laughs> that means that if, okay. if a woman puts this cosmetic on, she will feel more vital energy. She will feel energized. And wouldn't you love to be energized before you go out in the workplace in the morning when you put on your makeup? So it's very much something coming again from the inside, even with your vital makeup, in a way it's a catalyst recovery from the inside, rather than trying to be what you think you should be for the outside. Right, right. And this, this inside will be bubbling. The inside will be bursting. So we will not only be a thinking person with intensity, but a passionate person, a feeling person with intensity. It's a combination of thinking and feeling that makes us creative to the utmost. So I think that when we vitalize the organic, all the organic objects that we imbibe in one form or another, some of, some of them we take as food, some of them we put on as perfume, some of them we use in other ways, but all organic substances have a vital component. We right now are very lost in the material. We ignore the vital, sometimes we throw away the vital. Sometimes we make the material so changed from the organic that it is doubtful that you'll still contain the vital. For example, artificial genetic engineered rice that Monsanto sells. Um, against this for the simple reason. We don't know enough. We don't know the vital physical connections today well enough to know that genetically engineered rice has the same vitality that ordinary rice used to have. It's very risky. Anyway, to come back to this, if we start paying attention to the vital, organic food, yes, vitality, even more yes. If we keep the vital energy and if we can make that as a commodity for economic buying and selling, the world can change faster because okay. people will see that the importance of the subtle, people will see the importance of the experiencer much more quickly if these things are introduced. Okay. We're going to stop there. I must say, I think you're 75 years old. You look very vital to me. So I think you're a living example of what you're talking about, which is very refreshing to see. Thank you. I'm going to show some of your books again. The uh, Quantum Doctor, The Visionary Window, DVD of the quantum activist along with the, uh, the book about the quantum activist saying can save civilization and God is not dead. Thank you very much for coming along to Conscious TV. You, I really enjoyed our conversation and thank you everyone for watching and I hope we see you again soon. Goodbye.